first of welcome. Good evening, good afternoon, or morning. And thanks for joining the session toward improving representation of data quality information. Um, organized by the ECIP Information Quality Cluster. And I hope everyone can access the Kiko chat room page for our session. And on this page, you can see a couple of um, documents here. By default, you will see the agenda document, uh, which we'll also use as uh, meeting notes. And also um, there's a section in this agenda document attendance and check-in. So if you have not done so, please put your name and affiliation and other information in this list so that we can continue the conversation even after the session. Okay, let me um, switch the presentation. Hope you can see my session introduction presentation. We have a pretty full agenda today. Um, so at the very beginning, I wanna give a very brief introduction to this session. So why we are having this session? Um, we hope to take the, uh, this opportunity to facilitate conversation, I'll say continue facilitating conversation and um, share experiences. And also we want to update EC community on the status of the information quality clusters recent efforts and also further strengthen the collaboration between the IQC with other ECIP clusters and also beyond. And hopefully we can identify some potential data quality topics uh, for future collaboration and future work. And our session today will contain two main parts. Uh, the first hour will feature four presentations and we're really glad to have three invited speakers to share their thoughts and work on big quality from multiple perspectives. Now, our first presentation will be Making Data Decision Ready by David Green, uh, the program manager of the NASA Disasters Program, followed by um, Jasmine Muir's presentation, Creating Trust in Earth Observation Data. Um, and he, she will introduce um, ECIP IQ, uh, the activity about data quality conducted in uh, Australian and New Zealand um, data quality interest um, working area. And then followed by um, invited presentation involving operational readiness levels within ECIP's disaster life cycle cluster uh, given by Dave Jones and Karen Mo, who um, are leading the uh, disasters life cycle cluster. And in uh, the last, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the ECP information quality cluster and the recent efforts. So each presentation will be about 10 to 10, 12 uh, minutes and followed by um, a three minutes or so time to address one or two quick questions. So feel free to put your questions and comments into either the Zoom chat window or verbally bring them up after each presentation. Um, and please raise your hand so we know you will have a question. Um, and also after we finish all the presentations, we will have about 25 minutes for general discussion. And this is also the chance to address any further questions you may have. And also at the end of the session, I like to um, spend like five minutes to do a little uh, Slido exercise um, for you to share thoughts on the takeaways uh, for this session. So um, any questions and comments before we get started? Um, if not, I think we can move on to our first invited presentation um, by David Green, program manager of NASA's disasters program. 
and he will share programmatic level insights on data quality needs for the disasters oriented initiatives within NASA and beyond. So um, David, please take away. Hi, David. Um, can you hear? Can you hear me? Oh, great. I guess that perfect. I got that. Hear you. All right. So you can hear me. Yes. You can see my screen. Hopefully, yes. maybe. Yes. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to try and talk about the where quality fits in as we think about disasters and some of the practices that we have to kind of incorporate how to move forward on issues of quality. And the issues of quality are really about uh, utility um, and being able to move things from just uh, data uh, for the sake of data to turning it into information, to turning it into visualization, to turning it into decisions. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of sharing of what's going on in my program but I'm also gonna wear the hat of, uh, I'm the current chair of the CEOS, Committee on Earth Observing Satellites. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in broad, the, the broader community. Um, by the way, what's shown here is radar satellite imagery during Hurricane Dorian, which can penetrate through the hurricane. And that's an attribute of, of the quality. Can you actually see what you want to see? Um, some of the points that we all discuss and I expect we'll hear in data quality are things like standards and interoperability. Is there consistency in the time and in the space? Uh, within our community, there's a lot of talk now about analysis ready. So what's the relationship between analysis ready and the quality of the information? Um, timely and anticipatory. Um, I bring that up because a lot of the information we've had about is you know, when things are happening. Well, the big push is, do we have the information and the confidence and the certainty earlier to anticipate changes, whether it's a disaster or something else, uh, ecological changes or, or ocean changes. We need to be have that confidence earlier. Uh, the questions of quality are also coming up in, uh, you know, it takes so much time to find the data, process the data, then we have a little window to use it. It's not cost effective in the way we're, we're dealing with data um, and we have to be collaborative. There's a big push for open science, and that means sharing not only the data, but the algorithms and the metadata and all the different things behind it. There's a big push on that and a, a value added uh, a proposition that open science. And so where does open science and quality come together? I don't think I know the answer yet. But maybe someone will address that. Um, effective practices. What we're doing is uh, we're funding um, not just research for the sake of research, but applied research that allows us to actually use data, tools, and applications, even in real world events to actually figure out the maturity of quality. And so there's a big effort on pilots, which are about, is it feasible to consider things like quality? And if we can, then demonstrate that it's value with that user-centric perspective. Let me remind you with the situation facing the disasters community. And I'll distinguish it for many of you from just thinking of the hazards. So hazards can be natural, disasters are not. Climate is changing. So it's increasing the complexity of the information we have to process before we even get to the point of knowing how to make a decision. Because we have to include vulnerability, exposure and coping capacity, which means this huge diversity of different types of data coming in at different times from social science, economics, from the earth environmental, and somehow it's got to come together. They all have uncertainties. They all have quality. And so it's compounding problems on top of problems. But at the end of the day, people do have to make decisions. David, hey, David. It's our it's is it working? We aren't seeing your slides advancing. Oh. We're seeing oh. the additional. Still on the first slide or something? You yeah. Anything? We are seeing your first slide and we're seeing the slides oh. on the left as though you're editing your slides. Can you? Weird. Might okay. need to share. Well, how do I go? I mean, I went to. What are you seeing now? I'm um, still so opening in a new window. You may need to share a different window. 
Oh, I have a different window. The only thing open I have is the PowerPoint. And David, I think the easier way is you can just click on the next right. slide. Yeah. Um, or your editing. You, as, so it looks like the editorial version. What are you seeing right now? Um, Sorry. Not up yet. It's not up yet. Wow. You okay. stop sharing. Now. All right, well, let's try this again, then. Sorry. Share screen. Window. Hmm. Let's try this again. Share that. OK, now we what? see the editorial. Um, what can you see now? Window. Still? Because I've oh, gone to. We can see it. We can see it. Uh, it's not the slide mode, but it's fine. It's in the editorial mode. You can simply right. click on the next. Changing slide. or not changing? Right now it's on slide two. Is it on a slide that says disasters program or not? Mm, not yet. It's still on slide two. Hmm. Now it's okay. slide four. Yeah, I think what would be All happening right. is All right. that seems like monitors. It yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. So you can see, so this is the editorial mode. Maybe I'll just have to work in here. Can you see when it says NASA Disasters Program? Yes, right now it's slide four. All right. The, the point I was trying to make is we need to combine a lot of information. So we're, the spatial extent, the timeliness, what we're really trying to get is decisions that are based on what's the severity that we're looking at and its impact on communities, people. How do we include that model data? And how do we get in? The, the real issue is how do we bring it all together to understand the risk? Let's see, what is going on? I can't even advance this version. Maybe you can stop. All right, right. click on that. Perfect. All right, so the vision from this kind of quality perspective is promoting the access to increase the use and utility, to inform the choices, to support the decisions, to guide the actions. So there's a lot of things that need to come together. One of the things, are you seeing Committee on Earth Observations? The Committee on Earth Observation Satellites Working Group on Disasters came together last year, published a paper on the issues of data, and specifically the idea of discoverability, interoperability, and analysis ready. It did address the idea that there should be a movement towards, in order to address disasters, that we have to, the attributes of quality of the data. And the idea that, the, and, and we have done things before on the quality of data for a individual satellite, an individual sensor, even maybe an individual network. But we are now in a world of multiple sensors, airborne, satellites, crowdsourcing. And from this perspective, that compounds the quality issue. Um, here's just what the NASA fleet looks like alone. Constellation of many, many different types of data all coming in of different types at different times, in different formats, but somehow we have to understand their quality, their confidence, and bring it together. But it's not just that. We've got airborne assets. We've got space station. We've got population layers and building footprints and all of those impacts that somehow we need to address the quality collectively. One of the ways we do it is this promotion of the open science, the ability to share the data, the algorithms, the tools, the metadata, the uncertainties, the certainties, and getting them into common platforms like our efforts to use uh, GIS, and not just for visualization, but truly for that analytics of that we can put these things together and ask those questions about how does the quality of the combination look and feel? How do we do that? We've got to make the observations and the collections, the analysis and the modeling, the visualization, and then the computing and computations. All those elements have questions and concerns on quality. While it's free access and increased utility is the goal, um, we have put forward, and one of our approaches is to use our portal as a basically a sandbox to bring not just NASA data, but everyone else's data together in a platform where we can explore these issues of combining information to see if we can get towards decisions. So our decisions need to be bringing data in a variety of timeframes, often in near real time, to be able to see what's gonna happen next, 
to provide situational awareness. And again, it's situational awareness, not for the, just the sake of it. It's the sake that people are going to have to make decisions and then take actions. An example here of the, what we've looked at at the community level, bringing that information down uh, of different types here. Is the power on, is the power off? Has it impacted where people's property have been damaged, destroyed, or the power has gone out or gone off? What are the quality attributes? Harmonizing high quality data products and services, improving the accessibility and the documentation of the data and the data collaborative frameworks and infrastructures, including environmental population economics. Similarly, during real world events, we bring together our researchers, our applications and our practitioners in this platform to find out if indeed we can put together the information of a quality that people can have certainty. And we do this not just for the sake of research disconnected from the real world, here during the ratios last year, using radar data, farming data and others to get to the point of people making decisions. And here during the ratio, uh, impacts of people losing roofs, trees falling over, soil moisture, land cover, building types, population distributions. Decisions have to be made. And here this year, volcanoes. People happen to live for a variety of reasons near volcanoes. We need to know not just is the volcano active, but was the volcano active in the vicinity of people and populations and their communities. And similarly, on a global scale, people happen to live near landslides, land motion and putting that together. So not only the global, but the quality of the data at the local level, because that's where it needs to be most trusted. So we can sacrifice some trust, quality and skills at certain scales, but at some point it's got to reach those who are making the local knowledge-based decisions. I'll just give a few examples, floods in Africa. But even here, a real world event, where, believe it or not, the FBI wanted to know what was going on in Beirut that had to have, didn't have people on the ground, needed to understand what the consequences were, and had to synthesize that analysis and said there were several types of impacts here that they never would have been able to locate without bringing information, not even at a high resolution scale, but at an appropriate scale that gave them the confidence to what was going on. Now this analysis ready approach is being used by uh, and discussed along, amongst many of many communities. Um, the way of packaging and pre-packaging the information so that uh, the products can be used, accessible, analyzable. Uh, in, the, in the satellite community, there's been a lot that's been done in the land cover land use. Just to let you know, because of the diversity of satellites and diversity of uses, there's now an increasing effort to expand the analysis ready for the water enterprise and the ocean community, and then bringing in this next generation of radar types of data along with many others. Um, I said that, how are we effectively doing that? Well, so within the CIOS, within the disasters program, within many others is we're not leaving it up to chance. We're specifically trying to do pilots to find out what's feasible and demonstrate the value. Here, for an example, NASA, NOAA, USGS, uh, Argentinians, uh, Japan, Germany, Europe, we're coming together around what can we do collectively to have better confidence in the types of data, information, knowledge and for a flood situation. Putting together our different attributes of collaboration, examining the feasibility of sharing, knowing what that collective quality is and assessing the tools together. We're working with the Open Geospatial Consortia. Again, pilot efforts that are actually incorporating this word of becoming decision-ready information being built into the OGC disaster pilots. Those again are focusing on uh, packaging our information in a way that meets certain standards, that implements on common platforms, that we can then co-evaluate to find out what does that mean to bring that information and data closer and closer to the decision worthiness that is sufficient to drive decisions. And then to be able to put that in new kind of frontier technologies of let's get it up into the cloud, let's get it in a place where people can find it, play with it, work with it, and hopefully decisions with it. 
couple of just schematics you can always come back to. But I made this point of saying, this is not, when we did OGC pilots and various things in the past, it was always the, the science, the technicians, the data scientists, the interoperability. The big shift now, we cannot do it without doing it in a user perspective. So with the user and the data systems, the resources, and in those things, you can see there's attributes of analysis ready, quality control, quality assurance, uh, and this kind of integrated picture. Similarly, a couple of examples here of just looking at this interoperability, data sources, the systems, and right in the middle there, you see decision ready information going into the ability to search that information and then feeding that back and with the user community. So we're getting to the point now of going kind of end to end from data to information to knowledge to decision worthiness and those questions of quality of being fed into each of them. So I just wanted to say again, these are the kind of the attributes and the reasons and the best practice is, is not leaving it up to chance but actually bring together support, fund, enable these pilots and these demonstrations. That's what I wanted to tee up today. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I think we have time to take one quick question. So feel free to bring your question or comment up, um, either verbally or in the chat. Yeah. I mean, my hope there was to, again, emphasize this point of, uh, we need to talk about this and we need to find ways of working together. And that's why I wanted to really emphasize that uh, we can't leave it up to chance. We have to design these pilots and these demonstrators in and around these issues and go end to end. So Sophie, I welcome any questions or opportunities. I think Sophie's hand is up. Sophie, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Justine, and thanks, David. I was wondering if it's possible for you to share the link um, that um, I think it's before slide 10, but it's the hub where we were talking about all the different effort um, that was um, combined in, in the same portal. Um, if you could share the link to that, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, absolutely, you can do that. Great. Thanks, David, again. Um, I think we can move on to our next speaker, Jasmine Muir, um, Frontiers SI Australia. Jasmine will provide an introduction to the Australian and New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group and their work on community standards for fair and quality data. Great. Okay, can everyone see my slides okay in presentation? I can. I can. Excellent. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I really enjoyed hearing David's talk. And for me, um, being in Australia, I don't often get to sit in on the, U the US meeting. So it's a great opportunity to share information about data quality. I'm here representing the Australian and New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group. And this is a community practice group that is really focused on developing guidelines and community guidelines specifically for how to produce fair data and also quality data. While my background is mostly in Earth observation data sets, the focus of the group itself is more broadly on data in general and um, not, I would say not limited to spatial data. So it's really a forum for Australian and New Zealand data providers, repository operators and data consumers. And it's designed to be able to discuss challenges and create strategies for how we can address these data quality. It's linked into ESIP's IQC group, as well as being facilitated by Australian Research Data Commons. And it's, it's open to anyone in the community who is interested in quality. It was founded in October 2019, um, also supported by Curtin University and Australian National University. And we have around 75 members. So this has gone up 50% in the past year. So it's, it's great to see so many people getting involved. Uh, we're currently involved in contributing to the development of um, these community guidelines. And we have a paper out on this. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more about this later in the presentation. And we would love to get everyone's feedback on the paper and just to um, yeah, have your comments and uh, 
also introduce some of your own use cases for evaluation and how these, this framework is applicable to them. So I've got a link in there to our website as well. So data is increasingly available from anywhere and there's a lot of different sources as David spoke about before. Uh, when you have a, a use case, you need to be able to know how to combine that data and how to use it so that it's uh, producing quality outputs and results. Uh, it's quite common now to take data sets from multiple sources and try to make them into an aggregated data set to achieve a particular answer or a decision. Uh, with growing awareness of the FAIR data sets um, principles, so the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, there is more to just finding and accessing a data set if the data set does not agree um, with the community standards for interoperability, is, um, we wanna make sure that it's easy to merge. And also if the licensing is clearly specified, it is easy to reuse. So the FAIR principles recommend data to be both, or all of these, um, but we're realizing that increasingly it needs to be more than just FAIR. It needs to be this quality data. With the rise of artificial intelligence and ML, there's also a move towards this fully AI ready. It's ready to be incorporated into an AI model. Um, this also relates to the use of um, the actual mo models and the algorithms themselves. Okay, so this is the document that has been put together. Uh, it's detailing uh, data quality standards and it goes through and uh, details what contributes to data quality. So it's currently open for community comment. Uh, there's a the link there, so uh, encourage everyone who who can. I'll pop this in the chat later on uh, to access the document, have a look, and please provide your comments. Uh, we're collecting use cases in this Google document too, so I'll also pop this in the chat. And really what we're looking for here is to understand uh, different use cases and how data quality is important to them, and also the gaps, so what is needed in terms of further data quality checks for these. Uh, in the use case um, I wanted to present to you today, this is actually a uh, piece of work that I'm involved in. So creating trust in satellite earth observation data and products. Uh, we're looking to create a test bed that will enable people to check the satellite data and spatial products that they're developing. So David's already touched on this today. Um, increasingly there's multiple earth observation data sets from all different types of satellite sensors, radar, high resolution, hyperspectral, and they're more commonly being used in uh, for problem solving and also for making decisions. Uh, they contribute a large amount of economic value to the economy as well, but we're seeing increasing uptake in the private sector and um, multitude of uses coming through. Um, so how do we really create trust in this data? Uh, I was thinking about this concept a while ago and um, likened it to how we trust our car. Uh, we know that when we get in the car, um, it's going to work and we'll be able to drive places. But how do we know that this satellite imagery will lead us to the right destination? Um, for Earth observation data to become widely used and adopted, um, providing the right level of trust is critical. And this does require that fair and quality data principles. Uh, different users and use cases do require that different level of trust. And one thing that we are doing a lot of is engaging with industry and not necessarily people already using earth observation data. It's people who uh, are trying to solve problems and we're talking to them about how they could use earth observation data, but we need to first create that trust so they will be able to rely on it for solving their problems. The SmartSat CRC testbed project is a, um, it's a research project. It's a cooperative research group, um, government, universities and um, industry. We're trying to develop a test bed where you can actually come and test the quality of the spatial products and also the Earth observation imagery that you're putting into it. Uh, we've been engaging with a variety of people who are you know, upstream and downstream and building or using these 
uh, satellite data and also talking to a number of uh, different government agencies around the world. So we've been talking with NASA and MPL and hopefully ESA soon. And also um, just trying to understand all these international efforts that are happening in, in this space as well, as well as what our end users of the data are trying to do in terms of data quality. Um, so the trust comes from understanding that explicit link between the satellite derived imagery and sample ground measurements. And this is, this is really important because if that link isn't able to be established, then it is difficult to understand the accuracy of the data set. So how do we create this trust? Um, this is through having rigorous calibration and validation programs for the imagery itself, uh, having data standards, uh, recording the metadata and the data quality indicators. Uh, I also feel that the performance is really important and documenting that through the user stories. So how are people using the data and how successful have they been? Uh, using the FAIR principles and also the industry engagement. So talking to people, raising awareness and educating them about how they can use this data set. So calibration and validation is important right at the start of the life cycle of a satellite sensor uh, before it goes into space once it's launched. Um, and we have different types of calibration and validation that will happen across that life cycle. But it's also important after you produce the raw imagery and through all life cycle stages of the data value chain. So here we have just a table showing the different data value chain or data life cycle stages and some of the characteristics of a satellite data set that you might need to consider at these different stages. So things like the, the swap with the, the resolution and the acquisition mode, um, thinking about how having a constellation of satellites versus a single satellite might actually affect the information that you need to present back to your audience. Uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is we've just finished a round of user interviews. So really getting that user perspective and then compile those back into uh, some requirements that we'll test further in a workshop and then move on to prototyping out this uh, test bed. So we're taking a very much a design driven approach to this, which is very much in line with that user perspective and trying to make it something that will be usable for people in the community who aren't necessarily, uh, I would say, experts in satellite remote sensing. Uh, we've also, of course, got the ISO data standards. We're considering these as part of the, the testbed project too as well as a, a list of quality indicators. So looking at um, further down the data value chain, how the models are developed for, or algorithms for uh, producing outputs, what training data is being used, uh, recording that accuracy and precision, and also having uh, specific guides on the use and usability. Okay, so just in summary, um, Trust is essential to grow the market for satellite Earth observation data, both in the upstream market, so that demand, and also the supply in the downstream, so the, the supply of these special products through to the, to the user community. Uh, trust in Earth observation needs to be created through reliability and performance, so showing that it does work. Um, we need that well-documented calibration and validation and workflow metadata. Um, and it, this needs to be shared through user stories. And this is probably one of the, I personally feel one of the most powerful ways to do this is having people uh, show their experience and um, be positive, positive reviewers of the data for what problems they're trying to solve. Um, and we also need to make sure that we're communicating to the end users in a manner that they understand. So this is using language that isn't too technical for them and that's really uh, human accessible as well as being um, simple so that they will understand it. Uh, there's, there's certainly not one size fits all for this uh, calibration and validation, and it's very much use case driven in a, lot of, um, in a lot of ways, which makes it in some ways more difficult to document and set up these standards. But uh, certainly I think as the community is focusing on this, we'll get those standards out there. Um, the, trust in Earth observation to develop, we really need those, 
those standards, the user education and understanding, as well as the targeted communication. So as I mentioned, there's a couple of links there that I'm hoping that we can get some contributions back on from this community today, and I'll pop those in the chat after I finish speaking. So thank you very much for your time listening today. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I think we have time to take one quick question from the audience. So free, free, feel free to bring it up if you have any question for Jasmine at this point. Hi, uh, Yixing. Uh, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Oh, hi. Yes, I have a question for Jasmine. I'm, I'm really interested in that idea of targeted communications. And so as part of the full concept uh, to come up with some guidelines on, on how best to do that. I think that's, um, it's something that I'm really interested in as well. Uh, all coming from a, a technical background, I see the power of working with the users and um, it's often a targeted communication for the different user groups. So finding out what they need specifically. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have the, the right answer for this, uh, that question. It's more a case of uh, situational awareness and, and dealing with them. But I think having those guidelines as a starting point, that common knowledge and language is uh, something that we're trying to do through these, these two documents as well. So that's a very long-winded way of saying them. I, I think it's a difficult question and problem area. Agreed. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next presentation. Um, Dave Jones will give us a presentation about the operational readiness level, evolving operational readiness level from the disasters lifecycle cluster. Great, cool. thanks, thanks very much. I will uh, go ahead and share my screen here with my presentation. I, I appreciate uh, Jasmine, your uh, presentation as well. I was uh, going through a lot of the slides in my mind for how we might be able to uh, uh, team up and work together a little bit. And we certainly are in the, in the paper that uh, Jinping is, uh, is leading. So I'm gonna be talking uh, here about uh, what we're doing in the ESIP disaster lifecycle cluster. Uh, that's uh, one of the many clusters within ESIP. Um, uh, co-chaired by myself and Karen Mo, who you just heard from uh, with a question. And uh, I'll ask Karen to, to chime in here during the presentation, uh, particularly if I miss out on anything, because we're, we're doing a lot of exciting things in the disaster lifecycle cluster, and we're working with real users and uh, trying to bring data to them so they can provide feedback. So um, on my next slide, I, I wanted to take you back just for a moment uh, to our winter 2020 meeting. Um, such a nice meeting, it was in person and uh, it was nice to see everyone. Um, but we put together a poster with what we were doing in the disaster lifecycle cluster. And the big idea was this evolving concept of operational readiness levels, we call ORLs. What are ORLs? ORLs are evolving to enable non-technical users to trust technical products or remote sensing products or earth observation products. And so um, this wasn't just dreamed up, dreamt up uh, within the disaster lifecycle cluster. It was put forth by the utility industry and the all hazards consortium here in the United States uh, because because of the overwhelming amount of data that's out there, uh, utility workers need to make rapid decisions and they don't know what data to trust and they don't know what data, what the source of the data was when it's put in front of them by somebody in their operations center. So we came up with these operational readiness levels, put together a poster and started to map ORL one, two, three, and four into these 30 second decision use cases, for example, satellite detected fires, perhaps uh, enabling smoke jumpers in Alaska to deploy because Alaska is such a vast area, they didn't really know where the fires were unless they had satellite data input. Another one for long-term drought outlooks, 
which is a forecast product issued by NOAA and the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. That could improve water management efforts. And that's been going on for a long time, but the products are improving and the products are being uh, based on additional inputs like satellite imagery. And then in intensified uh, activity detected on a volcano. Get the tourists out of there. Um, there was uh, perhaps uh, canceled tours because uh, of noticing of the rumbles going on and earthquakes around volcanoes. So this was all also driven by the All Hazards Consortium. You can see the quote in the bottom from Tom Moran, who's the All Hazards Consortium Executive Director. He says, the sharing of trusted information drives decision-making and shortens response time. Data can support community lifelines efficiently when it has an associated ORL number. So we started to see real traction. As a matter of fact, not only is Karen talking away here at the poster in person, I like to stare at that picture, just saying, yeah, we, we can get close to each other at some point in time. Um, and she's talking about ORLs and the big idea. Uh, during that winter meeting, we also had a, a side meeting with utility industry executives and the All Hazards Consortium and GIS experts coming together to talk about how we can leverage and deliver data into those decision making environments that require minute by minute updates that require the latest thing so they can really uh, make their decisions. And so Move ahead to the winter 2021. This is just this past January, where we had our online meeting, but we refined the poster a little bit to not only include ORLs, but to talk about how we could accelerate the collaboration between ESIP clusters, because there are some really smart people in ESIP, um, and we really want to leverage their knowledge in their domains and their areas of expertise. So why couldn't we take the discovery cluster, the drone cluster, air quality cluster, the data quality cluster, and the ESIP FAIR, DQI folks and say, you know, what is it that you're working on that we might be able to apply in this evolving concept that we have within the disaster lifecycle cluster that I'll get to in just a minute. Tom Moran chimed in again from the, from the All Hazards Consortium, and he says there's so much data available to help decision makers but our members, he's called talking about members of the All Hazards Consortium, of which there are 45,000 of them in the utility, food, fuel, transportation, communication, and emergency management sectors, broadening a broad, broad reach across um, uh, private sector and public sectors. He's saying if they're not sure they can trust the data and how to use it, they can't make good decisions. So ESIP and GeoCollaborate can be a very powerful combination to put more data to work. And that's what we started to talk about, how we can leverage collaboration technology to work with users who know nothing about earth science data, who know nothing about GIS data, but they wanna use and leverage the power of it. So we did that with the winter 2021 meeting. And then we had a session in that same meeting where we talked about California burning, which is happening again, but putting data to work. And you see on the right hand side, we asked a question to create a word cloud. What do you think trusted data is? How do you define it? And so we had a lot of great input, validated, timely availability from a trusted source, validated against other data, accurate, all that sort of stuff. So we took that input and we made that a charge for the summer meeting, which is this meeting uh, that we're in today. And uh, one of the things that we really wanted to accelerate is that last bullet down there, work with clusters to accelerate this ecosystem of innovation, this ESIP ecosystem of innovation. And so I wanna go back to ORLs just for a moment because why develop them? What in the world are they? We really haven't heard about them before. We've been working on them for about two and a half years, almost three years now. We see ORLs as a pathway to accelerating research to operations. 
because ORLs, if you have an ORL of one, it's, it's there all the time. It's updated frequently. It has a person to call if you have a problem. It has a secure connection. It has uh, uh, updates if the service changes, things like that. But we can use ORLs to um, introduce emerging data products and introduce them with credible operational qualifiers. For example, if someone needs to know where the burn scar is of a certain wildfire and Landsat passes over, it depends on where in the fire Landsat passes over. But we can say, look, it's going to come over again in 16 days, and we'll give you that update. In the meantime, here's how you can use this product. So we're giving not a product that's updated all the time, but one that has a 16-day repeat, but can be valuable if presented to a decision maker with those qualifiers. So as research data matures and moves towards potential operational applications, the ORNL, ORL number will go up. ORL4 is like, hey, it's research data, but it might be useful. So use it with that cautionary um, qualifier. Uh, but when that sensor transitions into operations, all of a sudden the ORL number goes up to three, two, or one. Most importantly, ORLs provide confirmation to non-technical decision makers. I mentioned that once before. We have a lot of users out there who want to look at a map and want to see data but they don't know what the information means. The more understanding we can make that data, in other words, the more clickable we can make that map with information that pops up about the features in that map, all of a sudden we've opened a brand new uh, world and a brand new universe to users of remote sensing data. And so therefore they can proceed with making rapid decisions that save lives and all that stuff. So, this is, a, this is a quote, again, from Tom Moran. He says, we need the ability for non-technical decision makers to rapidly assess the impacts to their system or business and move forward with small and big decisions, sometimes really big, multi-million dollar decisions. Where are we going to put these 500 bucket trucks and station them before this hurricane makes landfall? They have to traverse across the country and get to a mustering location. So they must have trust in the information that is driving their decisions. And so there is an ORL model decision tree. You might be thinking, well, what defines these ORLs? We have ORL1 on the left-hand side if it meets all these things like trusted and vetted source, interoperability is optimized, no downtime, change modifications issued, metadata completeness, things like that. Um, but then as you go down the, the chain, ORL2, then ORL3, and ORL4, you see the resulting yes or no's in that decision tree. And so what we did is we put together a survey one, two, three form for these ORL numbers. And you see it here. There's a link, and I can put that in the chat before this session is over, because we would love your input. We provided this to the data quality cluster within ESIP when Karen and I presented before, and we wanted to get input on what are we missing from a data quality perspective that an operational decision maker can use. So these are just three pages of a, of a long form that you fill out uh, to start answering questions to get your data ranked. And there's resources in this uh, PowerPoint here um, where we have video descriptions of what ORLs and, uh, are in the process um, of how they're used and ORL model and operations and what a description is. And then ORLs will really help us evolve the ESIP ecosystem of innovation. We wanna focus on identifying evolving data sources and use cases. This is what we had our session on Monday about including automated intelligence and machine learning and the cloud, how they can work together to deliver really what David mentioned, decision-ready information. Decision-ready information in my book requires no further manipulation. It's gonna be provided right in front of your face. You can manipulate it by zooming in and zooming out of the map and adding other data sets on top of it, like where your trucks are heading or where, what areas you need to evacuate and include users, include users in the product development life cycle. What a concept, right?
Get users involved from the very get-go and start iterating products with them so they can feel like they have ownership and they can help that product along. And I will guarantee you 100% when you launch that product operationally, you'll have a heck of a lot more users than if you developed it in your own office. And so provide feedback to the product developer and transition the data and service into operations in a phased approach with ORL rankings. So graphically, this is what the ESIP ecosystem of innovation looks like. You have clusters, anybody within ESIP or partners of ESIP providing input, whether it's a widget, whether it's a question, whether it's a, a topic, whether it's a data service, that goes into the disaster lifecycle cluster. We can then test it with all of these users, All Hazards Consortium, NOAA, DHS, the state of Florida, the National Weather Service, NASA, say, is this helpful for you? We can take that feedback and provide it right back into the curator of that product. And everybody's quality goes up and the user is involved and will trust that data set once it's uh, introduced into operations. So, so that's what we've been doing in the ESIP disaster lifecycle cluster. I just wanted to ask Karen if there was anything I missed and um, certainly we look forward to the conversation uh, in the rest of this uh, meeting. So thanks very much. Yeah, just uh, the, the thing I would uh, add is that um, when I asked the question of Jasmine about the targeted communications, um, I was thinking about how our efforts here uh, worked uh, based on the commitment that uh, we have made to participate with the All Hazards uh, Consortium, which was weekly meetings um, for the last six years. <laughs> and so that's the type of targeted communications. And there are probably, um, uh, you know, other best practices that uh, maybe are not quite so um, intensive. But uh, I think that's an area where we might look for opportunities to um, uh, improve that communication with the end users so that we can communicate well with them about uh, the capabilities that this data brings forward. That's right. That, thank you, Karen. That's an excellent point. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn the floor uh, back to you uh, um, and uh, answer questions as we start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave and Karen. I think we can take one very quick question, if there's any from the audience. Okay, we have one question from Chunlin. Um, Dave and Karen, would AI and machine learning for different ORLs data need the respective ORL training data? Uh, Chunlin, do you mind elaborating that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David and Karen. Uh, my question, okay, I'm just, uh, I'm not an AI expert here, but I just wonder, because uh, David mentioned about the AI machine learning. So I just wonder, so you will, you will this OIL, I think I attended last year as well. It's very effective, very good. But my, my question is that, so for different, ORL data, if we say we are going to apply AI to their different ORL data, should we collect different ORL training data to do that? Okay. Well, it's a, that's, a great, that's a great question. And so when I think of, uh, when you talk about training data, do you mean training the model for AI? Yes, right, something like that, yes, right. Right, so, so uh, a decision maker, at least the ones that we work with, won't really, it's not that they won't care about the process in getting the AI answer to them. They want right. to be able to trust it, right? So, so as you put together uh, AI methods or machine learning approaches, um, being able to describe how that product, how that final product has come together mm -hmm. to give them a nugget of information that's gonna help them make a decision will be very important because that will all lead to trust. Right. So so the more you train these models and you can explain how they were trained, then that output becomes very, very valuable, particularly when it's integrated with other products from disparate sources that they trust as well. So so actually, my understanding of what you just say here. 
So well, so for this training data, just like a big collect training data, then after the model get the result, then you kind of then you kind of just interpret to the different level of ORL. So well, like, then I would right. say I would say before you assign an ORL to it, then you're then you include the user in seeing if that model is spitting out information that could be useful for them. Yes, if they right. say this is the best thing since sliced bread and it's timely and the person producing it has the 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 ability to uh, make it uh, uh, happen all the time, uh, then it would get an ORL of a one if uh, if it's supported and and uh, all that sort of stuff or a two. O ORL one, two, three, and four, they're all trusted data. It really comes down to timeliness uh, yeah. as well uh, for uh, when that product can be collected, processed, and delivered. Great, thank you. Thanks again, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thanks Dave and Karen. Okay, now time for my uh, our last presentation. That's going to be me. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay? I assume you can all see my Yes, screen. we can see yeah, it. Good. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so um, in this presentation, I'm going to give you an overview of the ECP information quality cluster and some of the key um, efforts um, going on recently. And all these efforts um, are teamwork within and beyond IQC. So credits really go to the leads of those efforts, um, David Moroni, um, Ge Peng, Bob Downs, Rama, as well as many others um, on the team. Um, so first um, about IQC. IQC was established in early 2011, and it has been more than 10 years um, since then. And Rama was our former um, cluster chair, and um, he started his retirement process last year. So I was really honored to have the opportunity to help chair uh, the cluster since January uh, last year. And our co-authors, our co-chairs, Bob Downs from CSUN, um, Columbia University, David Moroni from JPL, uh, Physical Oceanographic Deck, or PODEC, and um, Ge Peng, who recently moved from NOVA, uh, from NOVA to uh, NASA Impact Program. Um, and they have been really providing a lot of help and leading many of the efforts at uh, IQC. So members um, of IQC represent uh, different organizations, both within uh, the US and also internationally, even though our primary presence um, is within the NASA and NOAA domains uh, with some involvement with USGS, NSF, um, and others. So IQC's vision is to um, become internationally recognized as um, an authoritative and responsive information resource for uh, guiding the implementation of data quality standards and the best practices of science data systems, data sets, and data and metadata dissemination services. So our approach includes um, shared experiences and best practices. Um, we collaborate, collaborate nationally and internationally and we invite speakers um, at monthly telecons and we organize sessions and give presentations at meetings like AGU, MS, um, ECIP, OGC, et cetera. Um, and we collaborate and lead efforts to tackle um, needing data quality challenges. And our wiki site provides uh, many useful um, additional resources about information quality. So in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to highlight some of the key um, achievements and ongoing efforts of IQC. So back in 2017, uh, the IQC uh, led by Rama published the paper ensuring and improving information quality for earth science data and products in DLib magazine. And through this paper, the IQC defined the four dimensions of data and information quality and their corresponding stages throughout the data product lifecycle. 
And those four dimensions include science quality, product quality, stewardship quality, and service quality. And the science quality um, is very much the more um, traditional type of quality that we have been talking about, accuracy, precision, uncertainty, and also uh, the product quality, stewardship quality, and service quality are also provide many important aspects um, for um, the quality, overall quality of um, data product or information and to determine the fitness um, for purpose of those different products. And David Moroni, co-chair of IQC, has been leading a community effort focusing on identifying a synopsis of the varieties of approaches to capturing the derivation and dissemination and utilization of our science observational uncertainty information. And this effort is looking at this from a variety of perspectives, including the mathematical approach, um, which includes like mathematically and statistically into how this information is quantified and characterized. And then the programmatic aspects, which is dealing more with the policies and the strategic uh, programs that are in place to sustain these things moving forward and to build upon what's already been done. And then the user perspective, which has been addressed in almost all our presentations for today. And this is important that dealing with how this information is being interpreted and utilized and how it's being applied in fundamental research. And then lastly, the observational slide, and this is really capturing, capturing more a variety of use cases with uncertain information is extracted from real observations. Identifying commonality and differences um, across those different approaches is a key focus area. And in 2019, we published a white paper, Understanding the Various Perspectives of Earth Science Observational Data Uncertainty to report findings from this effort. And the initial focus was on the traditional um, remote sensing or observations and on discovery of approaches instead of recommendations. And recently, this effort has been expanded to cover additional types of data, including field observations, airborne, um, and modeling and synthesis data products, and also trying to identify recommendations for capturing, representing, and delivering uncertainty information. And um, last, I just want to share this international um, uh, data quality information guidelines. And this has been well addressed in Jasmine's presentation um, earlier. And this was a large uh, international collaboration effort across multiple uh, research and interest groups, including um, the ECP Information Quality Cluster and also our Australian U New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group and um, many others. And Ge Peng from the IQC has been leading this effort um, since I think last year. And um, um, back in uh, May this year, um, we published this call to action statement um, essay on CoData Data Science Journal. And as Jasmine has, been men uh, has mentioned that the community review of the FAIR DQI guidelines document draft um, is almost done. And uh, I think the leading authors are the team of currently addressing the review comments. And this is a really a community engagement effort, including many um, partners like EC, AGU, RDA, OGC, um, our Australia and New Zealand um, colleagues. And uh, the near term plan is to finish addressing review comments and the baseline 
uh, of the guidelines. And uh, we continue to engage global Earth um, and geospatial science communities. There are already a number of um, activities that we have planned for later this year, including this RDA session that's going to happen on November in November 2021. And I really like, like to assess the interest from more broader RDA community in um, addition to the earth science community that we have been uh, really working on. Um, so um, there are uh, many other achievements and ongoing activities and uh, one thing I just want to highlight on this slide is the paper perspectives on citizen science data quality, which was published in April. And this effort was led by Bob Downs, um, also one of the co-chairs of EC by QC. And this um, perspective paper was published on Journal of Frontiers in Climate. Um, other ongoing activities include this uncertainty follow-on papers. Um, and also the FAIR DQI guideline use cases, which Jasmine um, introduced in her presentation, and some other um, collaboration and uh, session that uh, we organized in the coming uh, conferences and meetings. So that's a very uh, brief introduction and overview of the recent efforts uh, going on in IQC and IQC is really looking forward to further conversation and collaboration across clusters within ESIP and also um, beyond um, ESIP. So if you have any questions for me or um, our co-chairs of IQC, feel free to bring them up. Thank you. This is David. Um, I wonder whether I could ask a, a question. And, sure. Um, so, so one of the things that we've been looking for is uh, as you develop these concepts and the papers um, is, is how to how to really get them into practice. And um, one thing I was wondering about whether there's been any effort with ESIP or with these clusters to, to actually kind of exercise these um, examples. And so from the, like for the disasters community, uh, one of the things we do in and around disasters is uh, we bring people together when the disaster is not happening so that we can actually experience the types of data, the types of information um, and see what it really kind of, kind of go through the scenario play, if you will. Um, and I'm wondering whether there are examples uh, of the community uh, trying to kind of really give people a sense of what does it mean to actually be working with uh, quality data uh, with a number of these different attributes and uh, to help kind of build that buy-in and to uh, learn from. Is, is there any any sense of that kind of scenario play, if you will? I, I'm just curious. Thanks, David. I think that's a really great question. And I feel that question um, is not only just for example, the guidelines that IQC has been developing, it's also for all those kind of efforts that uh, I believe also uh, the operational, for example, operational readiness level that disasters life cycle cluster has been um, working on. So I think I wanna go back to this outreach to the target user community that both Jasmine and Dave they have mentioned in their presentation. I think that's really, really the key. And you have the guidelines and how you can apply that guidelines in um, the real practice, uh, which involves not only um, the, the people that might be affected by, for example, the decision that you're going to make, but also how you can collaborate with um, 
the target user community who provide data from upstream. And then how we how those kind of quality data products can be used by downstream applications. And this involves a wide range of user community uh, from both upstream and, uh, and downstream. I think this kind of uh, data quality use cases, collection um, efforts that has been going on that um, Jasmine has made mention, has mentioned, and that's also a collaboration effort um, that IQC has involved. I think that's one potential um, um, approach to really get the guidelines that we develop here into, into some practice, identify some target um, areas and um, the related data products and talk with the producers and managers of those data products and really get those guidelines in practice and also collect feedback because the guidelines need improvements and involving. And I think this re requires a lot of efforts um, and it should be uh, one of the key focuses that IQC and uh, other um, data quality um, groups um, be focusing on. So I, I'd like to hear um, others' thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, Xing, I'd like to mm -hmm. add uh, um, to what you have said uh, regarding to David's question. Uh, one of the use cases developed by one of the co-chairs of the International um, Fair DQI Working Group, um, he used the uh, one of the guidelines um, that in terms of disseminating data quality information and how that guide users to make decisions on using the best data sets for, um, I think it's wind, um, the applications. Is that something you kind of, uh, you are looking for in terms of how, how actually um, put into practice for real scenarios? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I, there, the, the idea of kind of building this buy-in by allowing people to have the opportunity to kind of experience uh, you know, questions or situations they're trying to address and uh, recognizing it, it, it takes time and that you know, presenting guidelines and presenting things and then expecting it to suddenly turn into you know, adoption and practice versus the idea of kind of really building that buy-in by uh, having practitioners and data providers and quality managers all kind of having a an opportunity to kind of really uh, test and see what difference it could make. Um, that was just kind of where I was looking. That's a very uh, good point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, um, we've even done, and um, I, think I was gonna say, and Dave knows, th we've even done things like hold workshops where we've really gone through scenarios. And again, I was just thinking that the ESIP community here between some of the clusters could actually provide an, an experiential meeting where people actually get a chance mm -hmm. to see what the difference is in feeling like, uh, you know, seeing the difference in the, some of these quality attributes and just kind of uh, being present, presented with it and saying, oh, you know, this is actually really good or, or wait a minute, this isn't working. Uh, why is that group? That group's got a different set of data. Why, why is that group being able to move forward and we're kind of stuck? Uh, it would be really interesting, I think, to actually kind of experience it together when we get together. Yeah, <laughs> you know, one that's of the, true. One of the things that we've been able to do with the um, All Hazards Consortium by leveraging the, the uh, collaboration capabilities that they're putting into play, which is um, GeoCollaborate, I'll share the screen just really quickly to show you how we've integrated ORLs into this dashboard. Uh, this, these are the fires that are raging right now. We have a combination of NOAA, her smoke model data and NASA firms uh, hotspot data and USGS earthquake data all in one. But over on the left-hand side here, you see the ORL uh, levels for each one of these products. So for example, uh, if you want to click on any one of these, like earthquakes from USGS, 
um, it takes you to that ORL model decision tree so people can see exactly what goes into making it an ORL. And if you just hover over it, the number one comes up. So what this basically says is that the earthquake feed from USGS, which is updated every minute, has an ORL of one associated with it. If you wanna know how that ORL is um, defined, you can click on it and see that decision tree. And, um, and the other thing that I'll, I wanted to mention is that the appendix in, uh, in the, the, the paper, uh, the, I believe it's the first one, uh, Xi Ping, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is about the All Hazards Consortium and their response during Hurricane Sandy and how okay. things are improving because of processes put in place, not just because of you know, uh, better information, but uh, because they've had workshops and meetings and they've improved the way that utilities respond. And mm -hmm. now quality information is being put into that decision-making process to help them. And so when you had a hurricane that hit a couple of years later, they had zero impact from delays, whereas in Hurricane Sandy, the delay was almost, it was about $980 million because the utility response was delayed by two days and that utility response was costing $20 million an hour. And so uh, you can put some real numbers behind the value when you put these things into practice. And that's very powerful. And I think Dave, I kind of want to emphasize two um, aspect you uh, in you know in the case of uh, or one is the um, development develop and uh, implementation mm -hmm. is a process it's not overnight it's not three months it's a it's that building relationship and building the trust to the product and improve up um, based on the feedback and the second part i think it's really powerful it's really the the con you know integration between research and applications. It's not just saying, okay, we have research, go use it. You actually working with them. You have that platform on um, geospatial, uh, geo collaborator that kind of pl provide that platform. It's very powerful. Well, and I, I, I believe very strongly that researchers should in, include or at least uh, brief operational uh, folks uh, because they might find out that their data has a lot more value uh, in operational areas as well. They might be thinking they're off doing a little research project, but they might also find that the data could be very useful for other decision-making processes. And I know it's tough sometimes for a researcher to uh, put their data out there to help with uh, something going on when they haven't even written their paper yet. Uh, but uh, there are in some cases really good applications for research data that's being um, collected. I, I hear that uh, the linkage um, to the target community and the potential use is really the key. And I also feel that we are facing with a very diverse type of target users. And from the conversation happening in the chat, I see we have like different types of um, applications of the data, for example, research um, purpose, or for uh, decision makings related to disaster. And those are very different types of um, use scenarios of the data, of the information we have. And uh, I actually have a related question um, for Dave about the ORL. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, uh, say, a data set if you are thinking about different target user community, and if you are thinking about a different user scenario, will a, the same data product have a different ORL? It could, yes, because ORLs are pretty much uh, use case uh, defined. You might have somebody that says, hey, a Landsat image once every 16 days is just fine for me. I'll make that an ORL one for my use case. But if somebody wants to do daily uh, fire perimeter derivations based on satellite imagery, that's not going to cut it. 
So you really need to move to like a GOES platform or a polar orbiting platform of mm -hmm. JPSS, NOAA 20 or SNPP to get those uh, fire hotspots and help to derive those uh, burn scars. So it definitely comes down to use cases. Right, so um, that means there will be different combination of quality attributes um, and also potentially those quality attributes of different with different weighting factors if you mm -hmm. if we switch from one application scenario to the other. And also that I believe links to the conversation that Ed and David has been having in the chat window, for example, between timeliness and the quality of the data and which one is more important for a particular type of um, application. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and if, you want, uh, if you want feedback uh, with no holes barred, work with the utility industry. <laughs> you know, because uh, just like uh, Jiping uh, mentioned, um, it's all about building relationships. You cannot, uh, you know, the old adage from Craig Fugate from FEMA, you don't want to be exchanging business cards during the disaster. Uh, and Karen mentioned it too. We're on weekly telecons with the All Hazards Consortium every Friday from 9 to 11 o'clock every Friday. Uh, last Friday's went uh, through a exercise of a hurricane approaching in days four through seven, T minus seven to T minus four. Tomorrow's is continuing that for two hours on four to two days before landfall of this hurricane. What are all these processes that are needed and what do utility industries need for decision making? And then the one next week after is going to be hit, uh, landfall to T plus um, two days. What's needed when the storm hits and then moves forward? So all these relationships are critical and that's how you can uh, uh, expose them to data sets that they probably don't even know about and really get very valuable feedback. That's correct. Um, but I do want to kind of throw that question back to um, David uh, in, in terms of fundings, because obviously the communications and engagement, it's very time consuming and requires designated effort. Um, all the, uh, in, you know, like ex intern international expert on the working group, they are volunteering their time it will not be very feasible for us to do that kind of engagement unless the um, funding are in place. So I'm wondering what, what's your thought uh, along that line? I think we're, is, um, is that directed to me? I'm not sure. Yes. So um, I think we're seeing, uh, a dialogue now that is probably really awakened during the COVID era, that the type of questions and the type of solutions uh, are changing. And that the approach that we take to investing and finding these solutions is, is starting to broaden. The, the, the blinders are starting to, to open up and that we're seeing a uh, uh, solicitations uh, with, a, with a very different focus on the type of uh, what kind of data and information actually uh, needs to come together to satisfy a variety of, of, of questions. And we're seeing that um, new funding um, mechanisms are being discussed. So you know, there's, a, there's a heated discussion now about getting away from just a grant based to supporting things like consortia and clusters, mm -hmm. and that we should be we should be looking to pools of people, that we should also be looking at more agile funding, uh, that the idea of the, the old days of, you know, three, four year, five proposals, and then everyone waits to see when the next big thing opens up, that it misses opportunities for, for agile ideas. So I think we're seeing, uh, we're seeing this from, at least in the US side, from, from you know, from NASA, from NSF, from, from NOAA, um, and we're seeing this uh, certainly in the UK with their collective efforts of, of funding and similarly the big uh, European consortia. I'm not sure my colleagues from Australia can certainly talk about their approaches, but I think we're seeing um, a, a fresh look at 
the types of things. And I should also say it's being driven, I think, by uh, the next generation. Uh, so one of the things that a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of matured scientists and, and, and practitioners and data people here, but I think we're also seeing some more uh, risk, higher risk, higher return approaches to investing in some early career projects. Uh, we had a long discussion yesterday about a lot of early career are very worried about, you know, getting results. Uh, and so they, they don't fund as aggressively, as innovatively as they could. So I think there's the idea of some of these things you're discussing here. Uh, I think there's some early, there's some um, there's a movement to encourage early career and uh, graduate students to be really exploring some of the things you're talking about. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. I just want to um, give the audience an opportunity to bring up whatever question or comment they may have. At this point, we only have like five minutes left. I think this is great conversation. Thank you very much, um, David and uh, everyone. So any questions um, the audience you may have, feel free to bring them up either in the chat window or verbally bring them up. Great. Um, okay, so we have one. Yeah, okay, question. good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bob Downs, for your reminder. Yes, yeah, so we have four minutes left. So there's one last exercise I'd like to have us do that. Um, let me share my screen quickly. So this is a lot of Slido uh, exercise. It's very simple. There are a couple of ways to access this Slido. Um, you can, the easiest is to click the Slido tab in the Kiko chat room page if you have access to that. Or if you do not have that access, you can go directly to this URL. Or you can go to slido.com and enter the participation number. 696208. And the purpose for this Slido is to collect any takeaway that you have in your mind in today's conversation, in this session. Like what we have discovered, what can we help each other and what knowledge and resources do we have to share and also, I know time is short and we have a pretty full agenda. You must have a lot of questions that you have not had the chance to ask. And feel free to leave your questions in the Slido as well. We will follow up with you to continue the conversation. So I'll leave this floor open uh, for a few minutes. So. Let me go to the Slido page, see if we can. Great, I see results are already coming in. Thank you very much for sharing. And also I will share the results um, with all of you who attend today's session. And this is also um, a important resource that we will use to come up with the three takeaways for today's session and also um, to follow on the conversation. Great. We have received nine responses. Oh, by the way, you can actually enter multiple takeaways. Um, you can simply uh, put different takeaways uh, in different lines in the Slido. So multiple text messages are a lot. 
so in this final minute, you actually, I was just wondering if maybe you could um, share the Slido inputs on your screen so we can kind of see in real time what's being entered in. Great, that's a good idea. Okay, so leave it a small, try to make it bigger. Oh, a minute. Okay, hope you can see it. Can you see it? It's a little bit small here. Yep. So some really interesting messages here. How to implement in an agile, in a flexible manner in order to support data usage. Good recommendations and best practices are emerging for data quality. Now there is a challenge to use and leverage them. Quality assessment results and ORLs depend on the use. Exactly. It sounds like we need to give more thought and consideration toward differing quality thresholds for science as being separate to quality threshold for decision-making. Okay, so we don't have time to go through all the responses. I'll keep the Slido open even after the session ends. So you still have uh, opportunity to provide your feedback. So we are already uh, one minute um, past the end of the session. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, all our invited speakers and also um, those who have attended today's session. Really great conversation, great presentation. And also want to thank um, ISIP fellow and uh, Megan uh, who have helped us to organize this session. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.